Well, good afternoon, everyone. A, a very warm welcome, and thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us for today's session. Uh, my name is Steve Olson. I'm a senior research fellow at the Heinrich Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing sustainable global trade. Now, I know that uh, many of you are already uh, quite familiar with the foundation, but uh, for those of you who are not, I would strongly encourage you to uh, visit us at heinrichfoundation.com, where you can get a, a good idea about our activities, our research products, and most importantly, uh, while you are there, uh, please, please, please uh, sign up for our uh, uh, weekly newsletter. I think you'll find it to be uh, extremely, extremely useful. Well, look, I'm, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to uh, moderate today's uh, a session on, uh, on um, uh, curbing uh, policy fragmentation in the digital economy, an extremely uh, important and uh, timely topic. Uh, an increasing portion of what we generically refer to as international trade is actually international digital trade. And yet we, we, we not only don't have comprehensive uh, um, policy guidelines or rules to manage this trade, things are actually heading in the opposite uh, uh, direction and we're seeing increasing uh, policy divergence. So where are we today? How did we get here? And, and how are we going to do better in the future? Those are some of the questions that our, our panelists today are, are going to help us unpack. We're, we're extremely fortunate to have a, a absolutely top-notch uh, panel of experts to help us uh, explore these issues. Now, if I ever uh, uh, attempted, their, their backgrounds are so um, uh, distinguished that if I ever attempted to read through all of their bios, I'd probably take up uh, half the session. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, their bios are available on our uh, uh, website. I'll just introduce everybody uh, by name. So we have uh, Professor Simon Evanet, founder of Global Trade Alert and professor of international trade and economic development at the University of St. Gallen. We have Stephanie Honey, Associate Director, New Zealand International Business Forum and the Director of Honey Consulting. We have uh, Javier Lopez Gonzalez, uh, a senior uh, trade policy analyst at the OECD. And because every good uh, relay team needs a, a strong anchor uh, bringing things home, we have uh, Peter Lovelock, Principal of Fairtech Institute uh, Access uh, Partnership. Now, the way we're going to, uh, the, the, the starting point and the way that we'll proceed for today's discussion um, uh, will be a, an excellent paper recently produced by uh, Simon and his colleague uh, Johannes Fritz at Global Trade Alert on this unfortunate policy divergence we're seeing. I'll ask Simon first to uh, uh, present some of the key points from the paper. Then I will turn to uh, each of the panelists uh, in turn uh, to share some insights. And of course, we'll, we'll conclude with some discussion and Q&A. Now, I know in this uh, era of, of pandemic, this is probably the 10 millionth uh, online webinar uh, that, that, that all of you have participated in. So you're, you're well acquainted with the ground rules but let me uh, nonetheless run through them quickly. Uh, first and foremost, this session is being recorded. So if you've got any qualms or any reservations about that, now would be the time to, uh, uh, to bail out. As the, uh, as the uh, presentations uh, progress, please feel free to enter any questions that might occur to you into the Q&A box. I will uh, be keeping an eye on that and, and feeding them to the panelists when we get to the uh, Q&A session. And then finally, at, at the end of the session, you'll see a, a QR code appear on your screen that will bring you to the uh, Heinrich Foundation uh, website, where again, we would strongly encourage you to take a close look and subscribe to our uh, weekly newsletter. Well, I believe that uh, adequately covers all the preliminaries and we are ready to uh, commence today's program. Um, Professor Evanet, could I turn things over to you and ask you to kick things off for us, please? Thank you very much, Steve, uh, for um, for introducing uh, me and for also to your colleagues for organizing this uh, webinar. And thanks also to the other participants who I'm really looking forward to hearing to hearing from rather. Uh, I'm going to give a short presentation on the very report that you mentioned, and uh, I'll raise some slides to do that. So let me do that right now. Um, hopefully you can see the slides in full format. And as you said, uh, Steve, the uh, 
main, the principal topic to discuss this today is emergent digital fragmentation, or rather the fragmentation of the digital economy based largely on uh, policy induced um, measures. Now, of course, fragmentation can occur on other grounds too, commercial and technical, and we must bear that in mind. But the focus here will be on very much on policy induced fragmentation. I will speak to this uh, joint report of the Digital Policy Alert and the Global Trade Alert, which, as you said, was co-authored with my colleague uh, Johannes Fritz. Now, this uh, report is based on two databases, the Global Trade Alert, which you mentioned, but also its sister initiative, the Digital Policy Alert, which has been tracking measures uh, taken by the G20 countries, the EU and Switzerland, uh, for some time now, and uh, is also providing, a, I think, a a database upon which uh, analysts can draw. So what I'd like to do is to summarize the main findings of uh, this particular uh, report. But first, why bother? Why bother talking about fragmentation and digital policy at all? I think there's five very good evidence-based reasons why this uh, is important. The digital divide is still with us, still holding back many developing countries. And we show this uh, in the report using data from the World Bank. The transfer of, data, uh, of digital technologies across borders uh, is principally, is still, is still uh, required, largely driven by the private sector. And as we show in the report, there are signs that the private sector's reluctance to do that uh, is, uh, is linked to uh, poor policy choice. The second reason why we need to worry about uh, poor policy in the digital domain is that the costs of complying with it fall disproportionately on small and medium-sized firms. And let's not forget the social significance of this. In many countries, the SME sector provides the backbone of the middle class, and the middle class is the thing which typically um, helps ensure that uh, politics doesn't swing from one populist uh, uh, outcome to another. So there's a real serious uh, uh, matter here. If we're going to have a digital economy growing, we need to have digital firms, uh, and they should not just be the large behemoths. The third reason why poorly designed policies matter is because they can discourage uh, foreign supply of, of digital services. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a particular problem uh, which we're beginning to see uh, growing around the world. The fourth reason is that poorly designed policies uh, can create trade tensions. We've seen this very much in the tax area and increasingly in the competition law enforcement area as well. And lastly, the last reason why uh, what, what happens in digital policy matters is because siloed regulators often pursuing what they think are cherished societal goals uh, can frustrate regional trade agreement negotiations. And perhaps the leading example of that was the damage done to the TTIP trade negotiations uh, by the members of the Article 29 Committee in the European Union. So we have five reasons why this is an absolutely first order topic. Uh, which is uh, which is worthy of consideration by anyone, I think, in the working in the trade and regulatory space. Let's um, start off with one very important point, which is that there's nothing in this report, or indeed, I think, in any of the writings of the people on this panel that I've ever seen, so point uh, to challenging the right to regulate. That is not what is being contested here. Uh, uh, governments are going to have legitimate rights to worry about you know, the protection of democ dem democracies, free speech, privacy. This is not contested. What is contested is uh, whether or not those policies are being designed in a way that is as compatible with the appropriate cross-border flow of goods and services and ideas and information. And uh, ideally, we do not want to design local data policies that reduce the contestability of uh, local markets and so reduce uh, or deny the benefits of uh, cross-border innovation in this area. And so essentially the benefits of globalization in the digital economy should not be sacrificed on the altar of national regulatory autonomy. We cannot let someone hold up a, a regulatory trump card and say, this trumps trade considerations. We need to find a way to pursue both sets of objectives. Now to trade hands, Quite frankly, this is old wine in new bottles. We have been considering, uh, we've ha had to address questions of you know, cross-border shipments of unsafe products, such as uh, you know, fish, which is not safe, or uh, toys, which are not safe, for a long period of time. So there are a lot of established principles we can draw on. Clearly, they have to be adapted. 
to this new context. But it is very important to understand here that although this is a new, relatively new area for many, uh, this is not necessarily a new area for trade policy and that we should be trying to learn as much as we can uh, from the experience with the TBT and SBS agreements and with Article 20 of the GATT. So that's by way of introduction. Let me get to the main findings of the report. There are five of them. The first is that when we look at the G20 and EU governments, <clears throat> and they of course cover the largest economies in the world, they have gone into regulatory overdrive on the digital economy since the beginning of 2020. In the first quarter of 2020, we saw, I think, 71 regulatory initiatives. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, we saw three times as many. And uh, the regulatory initiatives are not just ones which have been enacted, they're ones which have been announced. There's a lot in the pipeline, about 40% of the measures that we've recorded are in the pipeline, suggesting that this is a very active area of policy and uh, that uh, you know, governments really ought to be thinking very carefully before they move forward, um, as they are clearly moving forward at a fast rate. The second uh, main finding is that there's growing evidence of regulatory um, heterogeneity. And this uh, shows up in a number of, of specific areas that we discuss in the report, one of them being data governance policies, for example. We have three chapters in the report which go through different areas of regulatory policy and show where divergence is happening. And of course, the key question then is whether that divergence is necessary and whether or not it could be shaped by some uh, developments of some commonly accepted principles. The third finding is a reminder that the digital economy is not just about the delivery of uh, B2B and B2C services or even B2G services uh, to, uh, as, as we traditionally associate with um, you know, some of the digital behemoths and platforms. There's a hell of a lot to the digital economy which relies on classic goods and investments. And so we take a broad notion in the report of uh, what the digital economy is, tracing it out from the rare earths and lithium at the one end of the value chain all the way through to supply to customers of services at the other end. And we find that uh, digital, uh, the, the digital sector faces its fair share of trade policy discrimination and investment policy discrimination. In fact, we argue uh, that on some metrics, there's twice as much discrimination against uh, digital goods than there are against non-digital goods, or goods in general, I should be careful to say. The fourth finding is that uh, the subsidy um, explosion that we've seen over the last decade um, has also tied up uh, or implicated the uh, digital economy as well. This is not just a matter of semiconductors, which is very high profile at the moment. There are many other sectors where there's subsidy races going on too, and this is something which ought to be uh, given some attention. And the last point is that you know, this picture of uh, considerable unilateralism is being very, very uh, poorly um, tamed or shaped by uh, joint initiatives. We do have good work being done in a number of the different fora, and I'm sure we'll hear about that. Uh, but everyone, I think, would recognize that there's a long way to go to um, tackle this unilateral and siloed policy intervention. So the in the remaining uh, time that I have, and it's not much, I'll just show you a few facts and then wrap up. So in terms of the regulatory overdrive, uh, this is the charts. These are the charts which bear out the first finding. We can see uh, on the left hand side a number of the number of new initiatives introduced per quarter. And uh, in the area of uh, data governance, these are now very significant, a significant number are being introduced, but it's not just data governance. We have intellectual property rights rules, competition law enforcement and tax measures as well, uh, which are very prevalent. On the right hand side, we see the breakdown by degree of implementation and the point about 40% of the measures being in the pipeline is reinforced. When it comes to traditional trade policy, uh, considerations here. Uh, these are alive and kicking. Uh, we can see on the left hand side a gentle increase, uh, and actually since 2019 is a much bigger increase in the number of discriminatory policies, tariff increases, local content requirements, uh, investment restrictions rules and the like, which have been imposed on the digital economy. And on the right hand side, depending on how you cut up the digital good space and different people do it in different ways, you can show that between about 30 three and 45% of all um, trade is, uh, 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 market access is covered by discriminatory measures which are in effect at the moment. 
There are significant differences across countries, which are groups of countries, which the report articulates, uh, both within the G20 and uh, across uh, types of G20 members and between different types of developing countries. I won't go into the details here, but I think these differences in policy regime are important and ought to get a lot more attention and discussion. When it comes to subsidies, we see um, uh, on the left, we have data showing which sectors have received subsidies. And you can see that uh, there are plenty of sectors receiving subsidies uh, other than semiconductors. And on the right hand side, one of the more interesting findings in the report is that uh, when you look across the sectors which have received the most subsidies, the sectors which receive on, on average lots of subsidies tend to have less trade and investment discrimination. So there seems to be some substitutability across um, these different forms of government intervention, which may become relevant as we discuss uh, later in the report. All right, what to do all about this? This is my last slide. I think ultimately the message is that the, the unilateral impulse is there. We need to channel that unilateralism towards uh, better policy. First thing we need to do is to take a broader conception of the digital economy and not lapse into narrow regulatory silos. Uh, discussions based on narrow regulatory silos typically uh, do not lead to broad-based coherent solutions. Secondly, um, we ought to adopt a principle of something like autonomy with accountability. And here the accountability is to trading, to trading partners. So uh, retreating inside your regulatory silo and saying, I have the right to regulate is not appropriate. Here we need to encourage the idea that uh, the goal should be to have proper regulation well enforced, uh, but uh, you know, confidence needs to be built in trading partners. And there are lots of good experience here we can draw, a pro draw upon. The third area is there will be uh, people in or governments invoking national security and other exceptions from time to time, such overrides. And we need to think hard about how to manage that process. In the traditional trade space, national security exceptions have been, I would say, abused in the last decade or so. Uh, and we do not want to repeat uh, the experience with Article 20 of the GATT, which, is, which provides far too little structure on government uh, uh, use of overrides and worse actually discourages trade officials from thinking hard about how to build confidence um, uh, when these measures are used. Lastly, an area which is very much bread and butter to our friends at the OECD and elsewhere is we should be encouraging lots more evidence-based peer review exercises and this requires not just collecting inventories of policy like we have done uh, but also many more analyses of impact and I'm glad to see that more and more research of that nature is coming through and we need to feed that into um, the advice that we provide to policymakers as they undertake their unilateral measures. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Simon, uh, very much for that uh, extremely uh, useful and insightful presentation. Um, for those of you who have not already um, downloaded the paper from either the Heinrich Foundation website or, or, or Simon's, I'd encourage you to do so. It's, it's an extremely uh, interesting read. I have to say I've, I'm, a, I'm a longtime fan of the work that, that Simon and his colleagues do, and, and to a large degree because I find it immensely valuable just to shine a spotlight and to illuminate on exactly what the governments are up to. And that just having that knowledge of what's going on can be really quite instructive and head us off in the right direction. I think clearly we see things in, the, in, in terms of digital uh, regulation are heading in the wrong direction. So a very, a very valuable contribution. Thanks to you and your uh, colleagues, Simon. All right, with, with, with that then, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Stephanie. Stephanie, we'd be uh, very interested to get your uh, perspective on these issues. Over to you, please. Well, thanks very much, Stephen. And also uh, thanks most warmly to Simon for this excellent contribution. Um, it's one of the most interesting areas of trade policy uh, that we're seeing in the world today. So um, it's really great to have this sort of um, big analytical uh, piece of work in this area. And I've been asked, Stephen, to just uh, shine a light on what's happening in the Asia Pacific in this space. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's very apt because it's one of the most sort of dynamic and creative uh, areas of digital trade policy making in the world at the moment. Um, unfortunately, it's also an area where we're seeing these sort of, um, but also unfortunately in trade agreements as well. So let me explain. 
explain what I mean by that. Um, I think a lot of the work that's going on these days in the Asia Pacific has sprung out of many years of efforts in the APEC context. So that's the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. Um, and it's no surprise that we're seeing a lot of creativity because, of course, APEC, you know, the old, the old saying is it's the incubator of ideas. And we're really seeing some of the sort of thought leaders in the digital economy in those conversations. So it spans from North and Latin America, um, Asia, of course, um, but including the, the big players, China, um, up to Russia and down to Australia and New Zealand. And so that has really helped to generate a lot of this interesting creative thinking in the digital economy cross-border space. Um, and we really see two big templates in the region um, representing, no, no surprise, the sort of two big geopolitical poles there, um, so the US and China. Uh, and they are articulated, if you like, through two mega regional trade agreements, FTAs that we see there. So the first one, the US, um, from the, the US perspective, the CPTPP agreement, of course, the US is sadly no longer part of that agreement, but had a, a big role in helping to design the e-commerce chapter of its of its predecessor, the TPP. Um, and its model is basically, uh, in terms of data governance, trying to essentially create a seamless uh, flow of data around the region. So the default is free flows of data, a prohibition on data localization, um, with some relatively circumscribed public policy exceptions. But as, um, as Simon points out, you know, perhaps without a lot of uh, sort of detail there. And in practice, in fact, we've seen that it does give a certain degree of flexibility, although it's designed to reduce, uh, you know, non-tariff non barriers to digital trade, essentially. And um, that model has been then subsequently articulated in a number of other agreements, including USMCA, the Japan-US Digital Agreement, and so on. And then the other model, RCEP, a much more recent agreement, this is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, brings in uh, the Chinese perspective. So on the face of it, it looks pretty similar to CPTPP, but it has a much, much broader public policy exception for those data flows. It's self-judging, it's not subject to dispute settlement. In essence, um, although on the face of it, it's about free flows of data, it really allows economies to do whatever they want. But then the most interesting part of the regional policy making is this new model of digital economy agreements. So these are sort of digital first agreements that are dedicated to designing digital trade rules. And the first of them, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, um, this is the, the sort of innovative model that New Zealand, Singapore and Chile agreed back in 2020. Um, and uh, subsequently, uh, Singapore has led a process of designing DEAs um, with Australia, the UK, Korea, um, and uh, really, you know, trying to build out this model. Now, the interesting thing about DEPA is that it was developed by small states and very deliberately designed as a sort of building block um, to broader policy making. So it's an open agreement that other countries can join. And in fact, Korea is a long way down that path, but Canada and um, China have also indicated that they're keen to exceed as well. Um, and really these are designed to enhance regulatory coherence. So work against that fragmentation that we've seen. Um, and then most recently we've seen the US lead its own model of this kind of agreement, the IPF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, um, which has a trade pillar and digital is a big focus on that. And I'd just like to share um, my screen there uh, just to uh, demonstrate, um, oops, here we are. Um, what I mean by this, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, sorry, let me just bring that up. Um, so when we look at the IPF, um, we can see these are the countries that are involved and that looks like a pretty good effort towards greater coherence. But if we map onto that, the other existing digital economy agreements or models that have ambitious e-commerce chapters, we can see Actually, it's really quite a tangle. So we've got an ASEAN e-commerce uh, agreement. We've got CPTPP, uh, USMCA, the US-Japan digital trade agreement, RCEP, the Australia, um, New Zealand and ASEAN FTA, which is going to have a digital, uh, more ambitious digital chapter, the DEPA, and then the uh, Singapore Australia DEA. And then there are a number of others in the region as well. Um, also bringing in the EU. 
So you can see from this that um, although on the face of it, uh, there are moves towards coherence, maybe in practice, we're starting to see greater fragmentation. Um, but then the other interesting thing about these agreements, and I know I'm sort of short on time, so I'll be quick, is what they cover. And you can see um, in the sort of brown blob in the middle there, that was what the CPTPP included, quite a, a broad range of issues. But without going into the detail, you can see that on some of these later agreements, they've really broadened out the range of issues that are covered. Um, so into the creative economy, innovative and emerging technologies, um, really seeking to create a sort of end-to-end -end trusted transactions in the digital economy, um, a much sort of more comprehensive and holistic model than was there in the past. And I think one of the critiques of these new agreements is that they're not very binding, you know, and some of these newer issues, they don't really have concrete rules. But actually, I'd say that that's a feature, not a bug, because exactly as Simon pointed out, in a lot of these areas, we don't fully understand the economic implications, the legal, the regulatory, the societal implications of making rules in some of these technologies. And really what these new agreements create is a platform to co-design, to share experiences, to understand, and then eventually out of these sort of soft norms to build hard law. So I'll leave it there, I'm, I'm out of time, but um, I think it's a really uh, interesting model, which hopefully builds towards greater coherence and works against fragmentation, as long as we don't see too many more DEAs. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Stephen. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. I, I think it was immensely useful for you to kind of sketch out to us what some of the emerging contrasting templates are that are coming to the forefront in the Asia Pacific. I'd love to uh, see where we are in five years and see if one or the other has really uh, moved to the, to the head of the pack. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, Javier, I think we'd be all very interested to get your take on these issues. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Stephen. And let me first thank the Henry Foundation for the invitation and also take the opportunity to congratulate Simon and Johannes for this very comprehensive and useful report. Uh, the work that the DPA and the GTA team are doing, I think, is of immense value. And I'm an avid user of this work, uh, both to get a sense of what's going on at the moment, uh, but also when we do analysis at the OECD on deeper issues. For example, we did some work recently on data localization, you know, mapping the evolving environment and providing a taxonomy of approaches. And the DPA and the G GTA were one of the first ports of call for gathering this information. I think Simon mentioned that, that you know, it, it's very useful as well from the analytical perspective perspective and we've drawn from it quite a lot. Um, let me maybe turn how to the OECD approaches the issue of policy coherence and alignment while trying to relate this to some of the findings of the report. Uh, for us, there are four key areas of action. You know, there's transparency, there's identifying commonalities, there's quantifying impact, and there's convening discussions. And you've seen all of these things in the last slide that, that Simon presented. Perhaps turning first to transparency, uh, I mean, I think this is one of the most important uh, issues. And uh, you know, a useful quote from the report is that policymakers are flying blind as they shape the, uh, and nurture the digital domain. And I think this is an accurate depiction, both in terms of where countries are in their domestic regulation, but also where they are in the international space and their discussions at the WTO joint statement initiatives or in trade agreements. Uh, transparency efforts like the DPA and the GTA are, are really important important, and they can be complemented with some of the stuff that we're doing at the OECD. For instance, we have a digital services trade restrictiveness index, which maps barriers to digital trade over about 100 economies and seeks to provide comparable framework to identify and quantify and monitor these barriers. We also have another indicator that rather than taking a domestic approach, looks at the international approach, which is a digital trade inventory, which maps progress in the different areas being discussed at the WTO joint statement initiative. So essentially, international instruments that exist via agreements at the OECD or in APEC, uh, but also looking at RTA provisions in, sorry, the digital trade provisions in, in RTAs. And all of these indicators provide sort of different facets of this evolving environment that are highly complementary. And we've actually been engaging in quite a lot of discussions with Simon and with, with Johannes on, on these. But I think importantly is that they point us to a very similar con conclusion, which is basically that there is growing regulation in this area and that is becoming increasingly uh, restrictive. 
And in order to maybe try to avoid uh, some of the fragmentation that emerges from this, it's useful, we think, to identify uh, commonalities. Knowing who is doing what and how countries are doing different things is important, but to enable these discussions, we need to find some kind of basis for countries to anchor uh, discussions uh, to. And we think that identifying commonalities in regulation is what is useful uh, here. Um, we use this approach when we sort of tried to uh, feed it into the G7 and the G20 processes. And so, for example, when we look at the different domestic approaches to cross-border data transfers, you know, we start thinking of, of all the differences of the, you know, the US system versus the EU system with sort of Australia and Japan sort of sitting in the middle, and then there's the China system. But when you actually go into the legislation, you start finding that there are commonalities like the use of contracts, for example. The differences arise in that, you know, in the EU, it's the public sector that leads the creation of those contracts. And in the US or in Australia, it's more the private sector. So if we can cement and promote the discussions based on the existing commonalities, we might be able to take forward the discussions on, uh, on, on further integration. The other area that's very important, and also Simon alluded to this, was quantification. And it's perhaps going one step further and trying to identify what the implications are of different policy options. And this is an empirical part of the literature that is somewhat lacking. And this has largely been because, you know, we have the trade data, we don't measure digital trade very well at the moment, or we at least can't unpick it very well, but we've lacked the information on the policies. And I think this is where sort of the GTA and the DPA like are able to provide further information that allows that, that, that exercise. It's important to, uh, identify what's in it for different countries in this digital environment. And so some of the work that we've done in the past looks at the implications of increasing digital connectivity on exports and has highlighted that the benefits of digitalization for trade are not uh, just for you know a set of sectors or a set of companies. It's not just the Facebooks, the Googles, the, the Metas, whatever. And it's not just developed countries. It's all countries at all levels of development and at all sectors. You know, when you're trading carrots, you're trading textiles, light manufacturing, any types of services, digitalization has the potential to increase your trade. And this creates a very strong argument for creating the enabling environment uh, and for bringing countries to the table to discuss these issues, including at the WTO Joint Statement Initiative. Um, maybe the, the fourth area for us is the convening of discussions. And one of the things that I found really interesting and that has been highlighted in the report is how this involves a lot of different stakeholders. You know, the areas covered in the DPA span data governance, competition, tax, trade, and many other areas, all implicating different policy communities. When we think of you know, data governance alone, it includes you know, consumer protection, intellectual property, privacy and data protection, national security. We need different spaces to discuss these complex and fast evolving issues. Uh, and these discussions need to be uh, well informed. At the OECD, we can sort of leverage our different committees. You know, I report to the Trade Committee, but I'm in very close association with the Digital Economy Policy Committee. And so I think that leveraging these different policy silos and doing joint things is, is, is a useful way of reducing fragmentation. Um, I mean, let me maybe just say a few more words. I wanted to say a few more words about principles, but I think that Simon has covered that really well about how, you know, non-discrimination, transparency, and least trade restrictiveness is very important. But I'd perhaps add that uh, interoperability is something that is new and that we need to think about more carefully and add into those uh, good governance uh, principles. But also let me say that it's perhaps not all doom and gloom. Uh, we are increasingly fragmented in our domestic policies, but there are these uh, international efforts that are ongoing, which are uh, perhaps leading us to greater alignment. And I think Stephanie presented in her slide, you know, a bit of a, a long overlap of all these different things. Uh, but again, when you look at the commonalities in all of those, there are a lot of commonalities in all of this. We are seeing increasing participation in discussions on data flows that are based on the OECD privacy guidelines or that um, increasing participation in Convention 108, uh, um, which, you know, discusses these issues or APEC CBPR with an increasing push to internationalize that. So I, I think that it's important to note that even though we are highly fragmented and that domestically that is increasing, 
including in areas of competition policy and taxation, there is also an effort that is parallel to this that is seeking to reduce it. And we, we are already seeing some dividends, including with a very strong rise in e-commerce provisions and digital trade agreements. And some of these are increasingly similar. So maybe just want to you know, leave it at that by saying that international cooperation on these issues is, of course, very difficult. You know, every country believes that their policy is best and that everyone should align with, uh, with them. But I think that, you know, efforts like the, the, the DPA and the GTA and, you know, indicators at the OECD and analysis that we do at the OECD and people like Stephanie or, or Peter also do help us find those commonalities that are, you know, trying to build into the system to reduce fragmentation, increase integration and increase the benefits of the digital economy. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Javier. Very, very, very useful. And I was um, particularly struck uh, by your insight about the value in identifying the existing areas of commonality and actually looking into uh, the, a little bit more deeply into the details and finding that perhaps, at least in some instances, there's more commonality there than we, we initially expected. So I, I think that's a very useful insight. Thank you. Um, all right, then let us now uh, turn things over to uh, Peter Lovelock. Peter, I, I mentioned every relay team needs a strong anchor, so we'll look to you to do that and uh, be interested to uh, hear your perspective on these issues. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to Heinrich. Um, congratulations and tip of the hat to Simon for the paper. Um, everyone else has chimed in, I'll add mine. Um, also, far more importantly, as Javier was saying, to the databases and the, the collation of information that goes behind it. I think we all find that useful. Um, Javier, I'm, I'm not sure why they always make me come after you. It's not Paul. But this idea that uh, um, policymakers are flying blind, you people are me. It's, it's not as though it's only the policymakers that are flying blind. Everyone's flying blind in this space. Picking on the policymakers as though they're supposed to have more information than anyone else in setting this is a little skewed in our presentations to start off with. Um, Simon, I think you know, they, they asked me to, I think it was draw attention to the impact of policy fragmentation on business. So if Stephanie does the government and um, Javier does the wonky world, I think I'm supposed to do the, the, the money-making, muckraking guys that uh, are leading this charge. So let me start with the three obvious points. And I think Simon picks, picks up all of these in the report. The fragmentation is going to lead to in, increasing compliance costs, which we're seeing go through the roof. That's gonna to lead to increasing lobbying, which given the last week, we all know is increasingly a dirty word, not advocacy, but lobbying. Um, as, as the private sector increasingly is going to try to engineer convergence, that gives us problems on two fronts. It's the private sector that's gonna be engineering this convergence as they, try to get policies and regulations aligned across jurisdictions so that they can facilitate business. But equally, they're going to have a, an incentive to skew it in their own best interests, which presents us with a problem of fairness and um, adequacy across jurisdictions, which we're seeing now replicate. And then thirdly, of course, SMEs are disproportionately impacted by the fragmentation and worse off. They cannot compete in this space adequately with the big players. Once that happens, we see innovation start to decline and we see an increasing rush to protectionism, which gets into a vicious cycle as the smaller players lobby their governments to have increasing protection and it goes beyond the subsidies that Simon points to and then we're in a vicious cycle that will keep increasing. And I think we're largely seeing elements of that playing through now. They're the obvious points of private sector impact for fragmentation. Let me go to some of the less obvious, more concerning points. Um, let me pick up three. What we see out there is that fragmentation takes hold as an increasing information or expertise asymmetry. Right now, the vast majority of the expertise for all of the topics that Stephanie had listed in the shopping list of alleged RTA stuff is, um, is sitting in the private sector if not all of it, the vast majority sits in the private sector, not in the public sector. And to, con to, to construct fit for purpose policies and regulations, we need people able to understand what they're regulating about. There's a problem first and foremost, and increasingly as the fragmented world means that their people are lobbying, 
we're seeing an us and them mentality take over, which means people don't want to share their cards. And again, we're watching policymakers play from behind. Um, the second I'd point to is the emergent regulatory arbitrage by corporates, which just fuels that fragmentation. This happened 50 years ago in the world of finance and tax, something we're now trying to unpick. We're seeing it in data and digital. There is a rush to housing your data centers, your data reservoirs, your more sensitive information in jurisdictions that you know either are safe or that you're going to get favorable consideration from. That leads us to a rush to the bottom unless we can frame something that is more facilitative. The third I point to is the skewing of regulatory outcomes that become suboptimal. And let's look at some of the classic uh, regulatory features that people like to point to. GDPR. GDPR was meant to give us a high water benchmark for privacy. The only players who can properly address GDPR, of course, the digital platforms that this thing was meant to be framing against. And we see this time and again with the regulations that are coming out framed around the bigger digital platforms. Look at the Media Bargaining Code in Australia and the new digital policy framework. The only people who are going to be able to address these are the larger players. What that means, of course, is that the smaller players cannot fully participate in a global environment because they can't afford to do this on a multi-jurisdiction basis. And again, we're back to the same problem. This stuff is increasing in acceleration. So let me take what that leads us to for the corporate world, the private sector, and Simon's paper and start with some recognitions. Can I first start with let us recognize that fragmentation is not emergent, it is here. We've been bleating about this for quite some time, it is here. We are already working in a very different environment and we need to recognize that as it has profound consequences. Um, think for example of standard setting, as the world becomes more fragmented, something that has worked very well in a globalized environment where you have expertise able to come to a table over many years and set standards, which the world then gets behind and adopts, needs a globalized environment, needs a lot of players able to come together at once. The more we fragment into these blocks, the less able we are. And we're going to start seeing standards like we had again a long time ago in a previous generation coming up in blocks. The obvious parallel here is climate change. Um, we are past the point where we are going back to something that was uh, as it should be, we are now playing from behind and trying to limit the damage we're doing. I think we need to recognize we are in a fragmented environment already. The second recognition is to recognize that digital is different. I take the point that Simon's made in the paper that there are lessons to be learned. New wine in old bottles, old wine in new bottles. I was going to challenge this one, Simon. I'm not sure which way it goes, but we have to recognize that um, we've been making similar or same mistakes as we made when we were trying to do services trade thinking in a goods trade mentality. We went down that cul-de-sac for many years before we recognized services trade was quite different to goods trade and it was doing something very different. Digital is even more on that. It is, it is exceptionally different to the trade that exists and until we recognize and start on the reset that we need to look at digital trade or trade in data differently, we're going to have trade policy negotiators and makers trying to keep fitting this stuff into frameworks which doesn't work. We've got to stop and get them start looking at what it is that they're framing. The third is to recognize that to regulate effectively, we need to know what it is we're regulating. That is there, is, there is no such thing as data or a piece of data, at least beyond zeros and ones. There isn't a data, there are many datas. There are lots of different types of data. So running out of time, let me give you three points that are suggested solutions that start from Simon's paper and all of the above. Number one, we've got to start developing data typologies. I know Javier is going to get sick of me saying this, but we've got to start down this path. We need to better look at what it is that we are regulating and not just how we are regulating. Until we start looking at what we are regulating, we're not going to have fit for purpose regulations and we're going to be doing one size fits all, which is our biggest problem with the regulations right now. The second is we need to recognize the information expertise asymmetry. And this means, and I saw it implicitly very strong in Simon's paper, we need PPPs. We need reformed PPPs in which the private sector and public sector are designing regulatory frameworks together that are able for a multi-jurisdictional environment. And the third, recognizing that digital is different means that the regulations have to start being way more flexible, start thinking sandboxes and sprints. They have to become more agile and reactive. And we need to set up regulatory frameworks that are able to adapt as we learn what these technologies 
and the processes around them do. And let me leave you with one thought. And it hurts me to do this, Stephanie, because you know I'm such a fan of yours, but really regulatory coherence coming out of those RTAs, we can map the acronyms across each other all we like, but when the language is that markedly different, I will beg Javier to find commonalities across those trade agreements, but the language in them is not even similar. We have no iterative pull through building off the trade agreements right now. The language that is being used across all of the areas is so substantially different that we have fragmentation even in our trade agreements, our digital trade agreements right now. We need to start the reset. I'll leave it there, Stephen. You said you wanted a strong anchor. And you delivered, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, great, great stuff, Peter. Um, your, your point about this um, um, information asymmetry re really resonated with me, as, as we've seen to, to bad effect in other um, areas, when the regulators don't fully understand what it is they're attempting to regulate, it's hard to have any, any good outcome. So that I think really, really critical point and some, some good insights there. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that, that brings us then to our uh, discussion and Q&A uh, uh, session. I think we've got uh, someone who has raised her hand. I have a note that someone has raised their hand. However, it is not apparent to me. Um, I would invite if somebody out there has a raised hand and you'd like to go ahead and pose a question yourself. To Eunice, please, Wong, uh, Eunice Wong has a hand up, Stephen. Ah, very good, very good. Eunice, if please, uh, the floor is yours. There seems to be a, a, a bit of a technical issue with, with Eunice being able to um, pose her question. So while we get that sorted out, why don't I um, throw kind of a very broad general question out onto the table, but I'd still uh, be interested in getting our panelists uh, perspective on this. Um, one thing that I scratch my head a bit, a bit about is Look, we've, we've all recognized and acknowledged the importance of this issue, the growing importance of the digital economy, uh, the fact that we need a clearer set of rules to kind of manage how we're approaching it. And yet, if anything, we seem to be heading in the wrong direction. Not, not only has progress been uh, in some respects limited, as Simon's paper points out, in, in, in a number of respects, we're heading in the opposite direction towards greater uh, policy fragmentation. So I, I'd be interested to get your perspectives. Why, why has this been so hard? We're all in agreement on the importance. We're all focused in trying to do a better job. Why has this been so hard? Why has it been so hard to make progress in this area? I throw that uh, open to anyone on, on the panel who'd like to, who'd like to take a shot. Can I start if, that, if that's okay with everyone? And also because uh, I like picking fights with Peter uh, because we agree on loads of things, but there are also some areas where we perhaps don't agree completely. And one of them that he mentioned is about data typologies. And I just wanted to throw something out there that, you know, we know what happens when trade negotiators get long lists of, you know, either products or services or data. And so one thing that worries me is that, you know, we start looking at data typologies, which often overlap and are not very clear, uh, and that that will create more fragmentation rather than, than less fragmentation. Um, maybe the other thing that I want to say, which sort of relates to the question that you're asking, Stephen, is about challenge a bit the, the issue about language and trade agreements. So when we track the language and trade agreements for data flows, it is true that you see a lot of uh, sort of fragmentation, so to speak, particularly in the way that the exceptions are formulated. But you also see a natural evolution where there is some form of convergence taking place. And so, you know, we can look at the RCEP provision uh, as, you know, something that is not really worth its, its anything because of the exceptions, or we can look at it in the, in the sort of the glass half full way and think that, um, you know, China has actually for one signed something that includes the principle of, of liberalizing uh, sort of data flows, which I think is very important. But to get to why this is all so hard, again, in the space of cross-border data flows, you know, different policy communities. And, you know, many issues are about privacy and personal data protection, but, you know, 
when you have to bring in the national security, the intellectual property, the trade, the competition, we all speak really different languages. And even at the OECD, where I have the competition people downstairs and the science technology people, people one floor above, it's, you know, it's really difficult for us to you know, meet uh, in the middle. The other thing is that we have very different uh, definitions and sort of relates to, to, to your thing about data typologies. But, but in some ways, you know, when we talk about personally identifiable information or personal data, you know, in the US, it might mean something. And in the EU, it might mean something a bit different. So those you know, policy domains overlap and policy and, and data definitions also overlap and lastly that you know we have different objectives we have a continuum of sort of trade-offs and you know the eu might locate in one extreme of the continuum a bit more than 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 the us so all of this makes it makes it really really uh difficult to, to for us to, to to come to agreement and again i just have to reiterate that that's when when you start identifying the commonalities and acknowledging the differences in the objectives and promoting dialogue across the different policy silos that you might start finding some kind of solutions. And I'll, I'll highlight that, for instance, what we found in terms of convergence is that, you know, the OECD privacy guidelines, which were set up in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, have played a really strong role in delivering some form of convergence across privacy. Uh, and sort of we've also seen that in terms of GDPR, which is significantly different, that a lot of countries have started adopting GDPR-like provisions. And so I, I, I would say that it's difficult, but that it's not entirely impossible because while there is fragmentation, there's also some glimmers of, of convergence that we need to, to take advantage of. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Javier, very much. I've got my fingers crossed that your somewhat more optimistic take is the one that predominates here. Let's let's hope so. Um, Stephanie, over to you, please. Well, thanks very much, Stephen. And look, Peter, I'm a big fan of yours too, but I have to disagree with you as well. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I absolutely, uh, you know, am fully on, on the same page with you that fragmentation in trade agreements is a real concern. And I perhaps didn't explain that clearly enough when I showed those slides. I think it's a real problem that we're seeing lots of very similar digital first agreements, but that are subtly different across, you know, essentially we're creating a new sort of digital noodle bowl with all of these ambitious um, overlapping trade agreements that have slightly different takes on the world. But I also think it's true that we are seeing them building on themselves and, and evolving thought as we go through. So for instance, on something that sort of, uh, you know, the, the digital trade facilitation world, um, which is obviously a very important aspect of digital enabled trade for, for the sort of old, more traditional forms of trade, um, so goods trade and so on, you know, we have actually, you can trace a, a very strong evolution in thinking and in sort of oper in interoperability of, of paperless trade, for example, or, um, you know, uh, sort of digital identities is another sort of really important foundational area where we've seen through the course of these DEAs, people sort of building on the thinking that's gone before and at articulating that. But also I do think it's critical that we bring the business voice into this. And that's one of the great assets of these new digital agreements that they bake in the idea of being consultative with business voices and academics. You know, there are, there are lots of interesting thinking uh, going on in that world as well. Um, but also that idea of being agile and responsive. You know, we don't actually have 10 years to design the sort of platonic ideal of a digital trade rule because by you know then we'll be multiple generations down in the technology and, and the regulatory impact so I think you know uh, it, it is really important and that's one of the benefits of something like the deeper that that is actually the feature of its of its policy making that it's trying to be responsive and agile and bringing in all the stakeholders in the conversation. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Stephanie, very much. Uh, Peter, would you would you like to add something? So, so I think the answers, Stephen, are, are giving you a, a spotlight or an insight into your questions to why it's all so difficult, because pe people like to split hairs and argue from their own podium, and they, they're all very strongly opinionated. Part of the thing we got wrong in the, the digital economy journey at the outset was going out there and telling all of these poor dear uh, policymakers that were flying blind how stupid they were about things like data localization 
that they were dumb, that, that cross-border data, data flows were good and data localization was bad, it was evil, it was, it was stupid, it was going to crater their economy. And increasingly, year by year, all that they saw was the digital economy grew and the digital champions got bigger and the money that poured into all of the startups and the innovations and the magical unicorns was ferocious. And you should keep getting behind. And they kept hearing that the sky was going to fall, that if they kept doing these dumbass regulations, which is a technical term, you can, you can talk to Javier about the stuff that's in there, um, that, that sooner or later it was gonna break and they were gonna be penalized. And a few of them blinked and a few of them did it and they sort of slowed down and everyone said, you've got to rush to catch up. We've got some obvious suspects here, Indonesia, India, Vietnam, Nigeria, they've all done this. They, they, and then lo and behold, the corporates um, started changing around and they changed from data localization to data sovereignty and they started locating data, data centers everywhere in many little boxes. You could do data center in a box that you could suddenly have data sovereignty abided by. And the regulators and the policy makers of which the vandals down in Australia were, were the preeminent, one of the preeminent groups with uh, the ability to come out there and set world leading subsidy tax like digital regulations that took from big players to give to old dying industries. And somehow this was seen as successful. The messaging we've got has made this our own difficulty instead of having consistent narratives and consistent messages about where we were going. This is where I then cop to both what Simon and Javier are saying. We haven't to date had the necessary measurements to really make the case strongly and consistently. And we've had a lot of people getting on soapboxes saying it's going to be bad. The corporates did themselves a big disservice by wanting to say it has to be a certain way, not without the evidence behind them. And Javier needed to be a lot faster and get a lot more of the papers out that had the economic impacts behind them so that we could actually get people walking in a certain line. I do love it when Javier um, argues with himself and I seem to come out the winner. Surely, Javier, that national security argument that they all mount that says we are not going to be able to do something because of national security concerns, we all know how much data is in national security. It's yay much. It's maybe 2% in any given economy. We siphon that stuff off so a lot of the other data can flow. It's an easy, you, you guys in your third floor, they know this. They know that we can separate out that data. It would make a lot of the e-commerce stuff very, very easy. Well, well, thank you, uh, uh, Peter, very much. Javier, my, my key takeaway from uh, uh, Peter's comments is that everything is all your fault. Would you uh, <laughs> respond to that? That is certainly true, but Simon can get some blame as well. <laughs> um, um, maybe just on the national security point, I mean, the discussions that we're having now at the OECD are about uh, government access to uh, data held in the private sector. And so uh, where the OECD privacy guidelines and where privacy regulation is a bit on the blind is that there are in the same way that there's very strong exceptions in trade regulation for national security, there's very strong exceptions in privacy regulation for national security. So when we talk about national security, it's a about national security access to personal data held in the in the private sector, which, as you say, the national security data is very small, but actually the national security considerations increase when it they relate to, to personal information held by the private sector. But I think I think we're completely in agreement, and I think that I was I was kind of nodding vigorously, and and maybe one of the things that that, that I really agree with Peter that it's not just the policymakers that are flying blind, and also analysts like myself are flying blind, and we're trying to make heads or tails of this environment. Environment. But and this is again going back to Simon's exercise. This is where this is extremely useful because you know it puts structure into our arguments and it puts it allows us to start understanding what countries are doing. We we need to do that. That's the first area where we need to work, and then we need to build on that to provide the evidence space for the discussions. Great, great. Thank you, thank you very much, Javier. Well, we, we, we've got time for uh, one more question, and I'm pleased to see that uh, we've, uh, we've received Eunice's question, so I will read it out. Uh, regarding uh, information asymmetry, PPP makes sense, but in reality, the relationship is often more complex with governments retaining their right to regulate 
as they wish, plus lots of knee-jerk regulation that have unintended impact. How do we make progress on this? Simon, would you like to take a shot at that? Yeah, let me let me let me try if I may. I mean, I think the and it, it ties together a lot of the comments which have been made up until now, which is that as we put the factual record together and then get into broad-based analyses of the different types of fallout from these regulations, we should then be in a better place to be able to identify where there are unintended um, uh, adverse impacts of policy. So again, I think this is, you know, we could grant that there is this regulatory overdrive. It's quite likely that it's been driven by a lot of siloed thinking, at least in my sense of this, which means it will have unintended fallout. We need to then document that, explain that, show that, and then bring it into discussions, to, often to policymakers who probably had no intention of doing this unintended fallout. And so this is the way in which we close the, the loop. Um, and let me just say one last thing, which really I think builds on this great discussion we've had, is that um, as we do this, we're going to have to establish much more of a common language on a lot of these different features. And I think this is one of the things that my colleague, Johannes Fritz, often emphasizes to me, is just how much in actually documenting all of this different policy, how it's become necessary to sort of establish what we are talking about and are therefore a common language, which then takes a lot of the uh, the, the disagreement out of discussions, or at least limits that. So I think we are. It is early. It is early days, but this work is absolutely critical to 21st century prosperity. We've got to get it right. I I, th I think so, Simon. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. Good. Good insights there. Well, uh, look, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that uh, brings us to the end of uh, today's session. Um, I'm sure you'll all uh, join me in, in thanking our panelists for a very enlightening, a very uh, interesting session. I think I leave today's session feeling perhaps slightly more optimistic in some respects and slightly more pessimistic uh, in other respects. So, so needless to say, an issue we're all gonna need to keep our eyes on and, and maintain our dialogue uh, moving forward. As I promised, or as I threatened, you've got a QR code on your screen right now that will bring you to the Heinrich Foundation website. Please go there and uh, uh, um, sign up for our newsletter. I think you'll find it uh, very, very useful. So once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. A very big thank you to our panelists. A very big thank you uh, to all of our participants. I will look forward to seeing all of you at uh, future Heinrich Foundation events. Thank you again and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.